My name is uh, Julius Juan, uh, the PS Early Learning and Basic Education in Kenya. Uh, I feel proud to be associated with the Kenya Folklore and Cultural Heroes Lecture Series. In my view, this is one of the most critical components of our civic education and history that has been missing uh, predominantly within our curriculum. And therefore, with the introduction of this lecture series, and the profiling of heroes from various ethnic communities, I think we, we feel that there's a lot of value that this is going to add to our education system. One is because that our education system, uh, the CBC as is being rolled out, appreciates the diversity and the cultural orientation of our people. One of the key things that is well enshrined in the Constitution is the promotion of culture. 
and therefore being able to identify uh, the people, uh, the heroes and the heroines from various ethnic communities in this country will go a long way enhancing the learner's ability to understand where we came from, where we are going to, the diversity within us, which again makes us united, is extremely critical. Within the curriculum, we have the component of citizenship and identity. This helps the learners identify who they are, how they identify with their various ethnic communities, and how the various ethnic communities form what we call Kenya. And therefore, it helps them appreciate that despite our differences in terms of race, religion, color, and ethnic communities, we are still the same, and that we need to appreciate one another to coexist so that the country can move forward to the next level. The other component that this brings to the fore is that component of the fact that culture can be digitized, that our heroes can be captured in modern history to reflect where we came from. And we'll check that within our history, there's a lot that has been missing in our history books. And I think this is the very first time that we are able to identify and appreciate you know, our heroes and our heroines who existed over 100 years ago. Because they, they bring out what is it that is unique to each community, while at the same time helping us identify what is it that brings us together as Kenya. And therefore, I feel very happy that this lecture is taking place and I want to wish everybody well. I want to encourage everybody to identify and appreciate what is going to be captured therein. Thank you very much. My name is Martha Shabuya Dalabu and I am the co-director at Shuja Stories Limited and also the illustrator behind the Shuja Stories card. Ashuja is a legend, a hero, a leader in a community. And so Shuja Stories means the stories of our legends. Shuja Stories was formed after the realization that there's a gap in our pre-colonial history, particularly that of the legends. There's a lot is said about the ones that led us to independence, but there's very little information about the ones that were there during pre-colonial times. And uh, I would, uh, for example, there's Mekatili Wamenza and Siokimao and Wangwa Makiri. Our target audience are the, the youth and the children and also the general public who enjoy reading these stories as well. The styles that we used in the illustrations have a superhero and fantasy feel, and this is because we wanted to attract children, because they are fond of such. And also it's the best way to, to show power in a, in a character. For example, the use of light to show power. An example of the superheroes that we've used this technique on is Luanda Magere, where his power is seen through his shadow. We also have Mekatili Wamenza, who was a prophetess, her power is seen through her ability to foresee future events. Then we have Mwana Kupona, whose power is seen through her poetry. The next step for Shuja Stories is to take, uh, to have children programs in schools. But currently we are having those children programs in our exhibition. And the book also, there's a book coming soon, a physical book. And there's also an online version on Amazon. I would like to take this opportunity to celebrate my sister Dalabu because he was a true Shuja himself, he was an Ipas warrior and it is because of him that Shuja Stories is where it is today and it's because of his spirit that it will grow even further. I would like to thank Professor Pielo Lumumba and all the other partner organizations for building public discourse on these superheroes through this lecture series. And also I would like to thank the National Museums of Kenya and Google Arts, Google Arts and Culture for helping us uncover more stories that were not documented before. Diversity is our heritage. 
Kenya has got a very versatile cultural heritage. And you've got people with different origins. And as they say that the Bantu cradle land is somewhere in the Cameroon area. Then you have got the, the Nilotic, which came from a place they called Bara El Ghazal in the Sudan, and then migrated down south. And then you have got the Cushitic and Hamitic groups, who came from the Asia Minor across the Red Sea through Ethiopia and into this place. As these groups were migrating, they were led by certain heroes, the Suba, who were led by one Wetewe and Kiboy, Mangeka, as if he was the, the hero of the Taita people. All these people had their heroes. Jews had their hero, the Kambas, the Buranas, the Tulkanas. You actually get to know the history of a people. Um, and, and that is actually very important in terms of preserving the prestige and the pride and honor of a people. And that's why we talk of limiting diversity. That, in my view, is what is going to strengthen our unity as a people and respect for each other. If we respect the origins and cultures of different people, technology is, is making our work much easier. I don't need to go to the, the Google. I'll be able to get the information to be able to discover our origins, where we came from and where we are today. I think uh, we should embrace this. We should uh, ensure that our children are given the opportunity to access this kind of information. I want to Thank Google for the work that you are doing, uh, partnering with the, the government. It is very, very essential and important uh, subject of uh, rediscovering ourselves, finding out where we are, you know, where we came from. Fellow Kenyans, our rich culture and heritage is a gift not only to the world, but a great asset in fostering our unity in our diversity. As we continue to work together in transitioning from a nation of blood ties to a nation of ideals, the Ministry of Sports, Culture, and Heritage has curated and brought to life the inspiring stories of 61 of our folk and cultural heroes. These individuals whose ideals, whose courage, whose leadership, and pioneering spirit brought hope and inspiration to our early communities and is weaved into the fabric of what makes us Kenya. Long before the scourge of colonialism cast its dark shadow across our lands, we knew the, great, the greatness of matriarchs, patriarchs, and the courage of our warriors. And indeed, we knew the grace and wisdom of kings, queens, and chiefs, the foresight of prophets, the awe-inspiring magic of healers and diviners, and the soaring oratory of poets, beaming life-changing lessons through folklore. We are in a time of great reckoning 
we must go way back in time and trace ourselves from all corners of Africa, understand why our ancestors left where they came from and what they were looking for when they began migrating to this frontier. We must look for our common vision in the dreams of our ancestors. We must seek out their wisdom and preserve their memory. We must bring them to life in a way that present generations can relate through technology. You can begin that journey by visiting the National Museums of Kenya page on the Google Arts and Cultural Platform to learn the stories of our folk and cultural heroes, relive their experiences, and draw the inspiration that you need from them in order to play your part in constructing and exemplifying our national ethos. I thank you. In knowing as we do that the world is a global village, wherever you are tuning in from, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, as we get into the second installment of our conversations around and about African heroes. I speak about heroes in the country now known as Kenya, which as we all appreciate is a colonial construct. Kenya, like all African countries, is the product of the European powers meeting in 1884 and 1885 in Berlin, Germany. She later became a protectorate and a colony of Great Britain and regained her independence in 1963, becoming a republic in 1964. Within the territory known as Kenya, there are many nations and these nations, sometimes referred to as tribes in the English language, have many men and women who have made monumental contribution in the lives of their people and in the life of the country we now know as Kenya. In this second installment of Conversations, I've chosen to speak about some of the heroes. Luanda Magere of the Luo people of Kenya is one of the heroes that I'll talk about today, as I will make Katilili Wamenza of the Giriyama people and Senteu of the Maasai people, not to forget Mwanawa Kupona, who was from the Bajuni peoples in the coastal part of Kenya. Who are these individuals? Who was Luanda Magere that his feet stand so firmly in the sands of time. Luanda Magere was born in the 19th century in what is known as Nyanza. Nyanza borders Lake Victoria, as the Europeans call it, or Nam Lolue, as the Lua would. He was a great warrior from a place called Kano. And his greatness was that he was an invincible warrior. His invincibility is, of course, attributable to things that are mythical. Those who knew him say that his body was carved out of stone. And as, as was typical in those days, there were wars amongst the nations or the tribes, if you may, and immediately in the neighborhood of the Luo people in the Kano area were the Nandi people. Nandi is one of the larger sub-tribes of the people known as the Kalenjin. And the Kalenjin and the Luos have some history as they moved down from Sudan and ultimately found themselves in the territory called Kenya. And it is instructive 
that of all non-Luo speakers, it is only the Kalenjin grouping of tribes in which we find the Nandi and the Maasai that the Luo called the Lango, the possessed ones, as opposed to Jomwa, those who don't speak the Luo language. And why were the Nandi called Jolango? Because it is believed amongst the Luo that you do not conduct warfare during nighttime. And this is going to be important when I talk about Nandi, about uh, Luanda Magere. So the Lango people, or the Nandi, and the Luos were involved in these fights, particularly uh, for cattle. And you know that cattle is something that is held dear by the Nandi people. They say uh, rather laconically that you drink milk from the cow, you get your wives to the cow, you sacrifice using the cow, you make your houses using cow dung. That is how sacred a cow is. And what the Europeans would call cattle rustling is, is actually not rustling amongst the Luo or amongst the Nandi in those days. It was simply reclaiming what belongs to yours and depending on who had greater power, you would reclaim back and forth. So the story of Luanda Magere. During his lifetime, his Luo people could not be defeated. When he walked into the battlefield, nobody could match him. And for many years, it was impossible to defeat the Luos when Luanda Magere was, in a manner of speaking, the field marshal. The Nandis thought and thought, how can we deal with this man who walks into our territory during daylight, sucks everything, drives away our cattle, and there is nothing we can do because of in his invincibility. They plotted and they said, the only way is to have a rapprochement with the Luos. So a rapprochement it was, a truce of sorts. And they used the age old trick. They said, now that we have established peace amongst us, is it not wise that we give you one of our fair ladies to be the wife of the great Luanda Magere? And they did. But the lady had very strict instructions. Go ye and find out what his Achilles heel is. And she did. Subterranean, surreptitious, deliberate, she waited. And it was the case that one day, Luanda Magere fell ill. And what used to be the modus operandi of Luanda was that when he fell ill, it is only his first wife that would turn to him. But on this fateful day, it was not to be. The first wife was engaged elsewhere and she called the lady from Nandi and told her, I'm unwell, and I want you to administer some herbal medicine. And she, he told her, look at my shadow, cut it a little, and you administer the medicine. And she did, and lo and behold, blood flowed and she administered that very night. She ran away to her people saying, almost like Achidemis in Greece of old, Eureka, Eureka, I now know. The man has a weakness. It is his shadow that bleeds. It is his shadow that is made paradoxically of flesh. The Nandi said, we have now found it. And that very night, at night, contrary to the laws of war, the unwritten laws of war, they attacked the Lua people. A siege war. And it went on and on, on and on. And Luanda Magere was ravaging. And as they were retreating one 
man realized it was now daylight, that we had been told that his weakness is in the shadow. He came back and stabbed the shadow and Luanda Magere ran away from the battlefield. He was never to be found until one day he came at night in a dream to some old man and said that he could be found at the river Nyando where there was a big rock. Hence the name Luanda Magere. Luanda in Luo means a rock. And that is the legend of Luanda Magere. If you want to compare it, those of you who are familiar with stories written in the Bible, you will read the story of Samson and Delilah. You will read in Hindu mythology the stories of women who have done their, uh, their thing to men. You will read in Islamic tradition. This is to demonstrate to us that amongst our own people, we had heroes of comparable stature. Luanda Magere, the epic of the Luo nation, whose story remains alive and has been told and retold, and I believe will be told and retold. But it is not amongst the Luo only that we had heroes. We also had another hero, perhaps a lot more recent, amongst the Giriyama or the Giriyama people. And the Giriyama belonged to the Mijikenda, the nine houses to be found in the coastal part of Kenya. This was a great lady, Mnyanzi Wa Menza known historically as Me Katilili Wamenza. What many people don't know is that the name Me Katilili came about when she got married and sired a son called Katilili. So she's the mother of Katilili, daughter of Menza from the Wagiriyama people. What is her greatness, this great lady who was born in the 18th century or about the 19th century during a period when the British were already coming into Kenya or the territory that we now describe as Kenya. She was born during that period. And during that period, it was tumultuous tumultuous in the sense that the British were running roughshod over the Africans. And the coastal part of Kenya was particularly vulnerable because that was the gateway. And the Wagiriyama, like those who lived in that part of the world, were, as it were, the bulwark against the activities of the British as they tried to get into the hinterland. And you remember uh, that the mode of operation of the would-be colonialists was to recruit and ravish and destroy. But Me Katilili Wamenza saw it very early on. And between 1912 and 1914, she was already telling her Giriyama people that we must resist these men and women whose agenda is to destroy our culture. So what did she do? To tell them we must not cooperate with them. We must not collaborate with them. We must remain wedded to our culture. She agitated, moving within the land of the Wagiriyama, in Kaloleni and other areas and telling them, cooperate, we must not. And they did not. And that is why they arrested her, Mekatilili wa Menza, with a relative who was a traditional medicine person. 
and exile them 700 kilometers away from the land of the Giriyama into Kisi land, the land of the Abagusi in Western Kenya, where mysteriously she escaped and walked back 700 kilometers. Some hyperbolically say she walked 1,000 kilometers, but that is neither here nor there. What is there is that she was arrested and that she escaped and she came back to the land of the Wagiriyama to continue with her crusade against the British. But the British would have none of it. Once again, they arrested her. This time took her out of the territory of Kenya to the land of Kismayu in latter-day Somalia. Once again, she escaped, came back to her land, continued with her crusade, but as nature would have it, she reigned her race, made her contribution. And historians are not exact, but in the 1920s, she passed on to the other part of the world so that it can't be said of her that she is dead physically but alive she is and that is why her story is yet another story that we must tell for the sake of posterity so that those who think that there were no women who are involved in the struggle against the colonialist activities may know otherwise. Me Katilili Wamenza of the Giriyama was a great warrior, a great freedom fighter, and alive she remains in our minds and in our hearts. But it was not only warriors that Africa and Kenya had. There was another great man amongst the Maasai of Kenya, Senteu. Not many people actually talk about Senteu as they should. This great man of the Maasai, born of a great father, Batian. And you know, those who want to romanticize history and permit me to romanticize history say that a land it does not beget a cow. And I believe vice versa, it would offend nature. So out of the lion Batian was born a cub, Sentau, who grew to the warrior that I am talking about today. His younger brother, now much more famously known as Lenana, was actually Olonana, to give it the correct Maasai pronunciation. He was a great man, typical of many African societies. The great Batian had two wives. And as his sunset days grew nearer and he was losing his sight, he had sized up two of his sons, Senteu and Olonana. And one day, sitting in his old man's hut, he summoned his first wife, who was beloved to him. Believing that nobody was hearing what he was saying, he says, I'm about to be gathered to my father, or to my fathers. Tomorrow, I want you to go to your son, Senteu. Ask her to come very early in the morning that he may receive my final blessings, that he may get the rod and stuff of leadership so that the baton is passed from my generation to his generation. Little did he know that the younger wife was out in the cow shed, eavesdropping. And what she did is not confined to the Maasai. It has been done elsewhere 
Readers of the Bible will know about it in the story of Isaac and Jacob and Esau. So, the young wife narrated the story to the son, Ole Nana. And very early in the morning, they went to the old Batian. And in that conspiracy persuaded him that it was Senta who was receiving the blessings. And the blessings he did receive, and they went away. So when Sentau came to the father Chagrin, the blessings and the rod and staff of leadership had been given to Olonana. But in his quiver of arrows, there were still other arrows. And he said, I'll make you to be the leader of the clan called the Loita. But what has happened is not good. Pain shall be visited upon the Maasai people because I have been the victim of deception. So Sentau, in order to ensure that there was peace, moved away with his Loita people. And the historians record and co record correctly that pain was visited upon the Maasai people. They lost their cattle in their thousands. But one day, after great contemplation, Senteu came back to his younger brother, Olo Nana, and told him, there is no wisdom in our squabbling and quarreling. Let us make peace. And behold, peace broke out, and the Maasai were reunited again. So it is the story of betrayal, the story of deception, the story of conspiracy, which has a good ending, the ending of peace. That is the greatness of Senteu, of the Maasai people, or the Ma peoples. But you see, today we said we would talk about four of them, and wisdom demanded that I choose two men, and two women. Of Luanda Magere, of the Lua people, we have spoken. Of Me Katilili, who are men of the Giriyama people, have spoken. Of Senteu, of the Masai's people, have spoken. Now let me speak about Mwanawa Kupona Bintimsham. Born of the Bajuni people in the small island of Pate, Mwanawa Kupona is known for a great poem, Utendi wa Mwanakupona. And if you want to listen to that poem, it has been repeated by others, it's been written about, and Mwanakupona has been written about because her poetry is comparable to the poetry that we read about in great works. I've had myself the advantage of reading Mwanawa Kupona. I've had the advantage of reading poetry as is to be found in the Bible, poetry as to be found in the Hindu Gita, poetry as to be found in the Quran, as to be found in the Upanishads of the Hindus. And the poetry of Mwanawa Kupona stands tall as they too do. Her great poem is Guidance to her daughter. If you read the Bible, permit me, we talk about the Proverbs in the Bible. Her guidance to her daughter in the, forms of a, in the form of a poem is as great as the poems in that much more famous book, the Proverbs. And what is the value and the beauty of Mwana Wakupona Bintimsham is a recognition that as early as the 1860s, 1800s, to avoid specificity of dates because it is not all recorded specifically, there were poets whose contribution was to provide moral anchors to young ones. Mwana Wakupona 
of the Bajuni people will rank amongst great poetesses in the world. And we must remember her even as we write poetry. We must remember her as the inspiration of some of the great poets and poetesses who have emerged out of the land of the Kiswahili. And it gladdens my heart today that when we talk about Mwana Kupona and we do so in the context of Kenya, we are also beginning to recognize and Africa is beginning to recognize that when we are talking about a possible lingua franca for the African people, Kiswahili will be that lingua franca. And that is why thinking about heroes is not about animating fossils. We are trying to demonstrate that their work and their, and their contribution to our lives can be given practical meaning in the world that we live today, that we live in today. One of our Kupona bint Misham will go down amongst the pantheon of great poets and great poetesses that this world has ever produced. Ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are, listening to these conversations. Our mission is to remind us that a people without a history cannot have a future, and that our history is built on the bedrock of the trials, the tribulations, the struggles, and the efforts of our great men and women. Today, we have had a conversation on the person of Luanda Magere of the Luo people, Mekatilili Wamenza of the Giriyama, Senteu of the Maasai people, and Mwana Wakupona Bintmsham of the Bajuni people in Kenya. We meet again as we look at other heroes. Stay safe, stay focused, and stay switched on, knowing as you do that history is the mother's milk of civilization.